Hello again and welcome. Michael Pozzola here. I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the Value Capping Rant. This is the 2019 Breeders' Cup edition. This will be covering the races for the 2019 Breeders' Cup coming from Santa Anita, Friday, November 1st, 2019, and Saturday, November 2nd, 2019. I'm excited to be sharing this with you. Not just for the races and the who do you like and who's going to win and boy, this horse looks strong, but to share with you the principles of a new way of looking at the races, a radical way of looking at the races called value capping. But before I begin, if you'll indulge me and allow me to introduce myself for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael Pizzola. I've been writing and teaching about handicapping for the past 30 years odd years. I am the author of the best-selling book, Handicapping Magic, co-author of the classic Pace Makes the Race. I am the creator of the original online racing form, now available as uh, Post Time uh, Daily 2.0, available at posttimedaily.com. It's a wonderful, customizable, good-looking, easy-to-use piece of software. So, Go um, look at it if you're interested. I'm also the creator of the Black Magic family of software. This is Black Magic 1.0. And the current iteration is Value Capper, Black Magic 2.0. This is what the screen looks at, looks like. And this is the uh, software that I will be using to analyze. There's software I use every day, but it's also the software I use, I will be using to show you how I analyze the races from a value perspective. Once it makes the line, my handicapping, my analysis, my technical stuff, eh, maybe a tweak or two here and there, it's over. Now I can focus completely on whether I'm getting a good value for the risk I'm taking. Um, If you want to know more about the underpinnings of the software, and more importantly, the, the concepts behind value capping. Please go and watch the Value Capping Revolution basic training course. It's free. You put in your first name and email kind of thing. I send you a video every uh, every couple of days. Um, these are full-length, hour-long, chock-full of information videos. One is on the value capping framework. One on the difference between value capping and handicapping. One on the 5x5 five five formula. Only the last one, it shows you the software and the training, the 208 videos in the training uh, course that comes with it. Uh, If you're not interested in the software, that's fine. Don't even watch the fourth video. But please, please watch the first couple because I think they will open your eyes, if you haven't been exposed to these concepts before, to a really different, new, and potentially profitable way of looking at this game. You can get it at valuecapper.com. The the framework in a nutshell, and you'll see me use this as we go through the races, but horses you like, that the public shouldn't. Preferably they're running against vulnerable favorites. You wait for your price, and then you get a felt sense. You practice enough to go, yep, that one, and no, not that one. It feels like the bet is making you. So, a couple of ground rules and some important points about this video. First, this is not a touting video. I am not a tout. I have never been a tout. I have never sold selections and probably never will. (laughs) Okay, so if you want picks, you can click over there or over there or somewhere where there's other YouTube videos. And there's like a hundred guys telling, well, you know, I think um, Omaha Beach is a lock in the, you know, well, whatever. And that's not this one. When I say I don't really care if the horses that I am pointing to win or lose on this particular day, because I hopefully if I get my price, they will be value bets in my mind, win or lose. And over the long run, not too long a run, by the way, I'm not talking about years and years, but over the long run, you'll get the best of it. Gone are the days where you could bet really solid horses uh, and find $17. Now, $17 horse. So when I started uh, back in the mid-80s, right? Um, yeah, you find a pace stick out that would, would pay that kind of price. Now, everyone's got decent numbers. They're paying $6. Uh, 
And with the randomness of the game, that's just too tough to pick that many winners to make significant profits. So this is not about picks. It's to demonstrate the principles of value capping. Really, just go. If you want to see my picks and you don't want to listen to anything, fast forward to the end. I'm doing a quick recap. Okay, go to, or better yet, listen to someone else who knows more about the foreign horses and all than I do. Okay, I'm going to be demonstrating this framework. Second, I'm making this days before the Breeders' Cup, two, three days in advance. I don't have the weather changes. I don't have the late changes, the scratches and jockey changes, and I don't have, a, I don't have any of that. So these are going to be kind of advanced bets. And obviously, most importantly of all, I don't know what the prices are because I don't, won't have the board. Maybe they'll forget a pretty decent-looking horse, maybe one that I've mentioned that's up near the top of my line. I'm good, good gosh, I would, would have made that horse 5, 6 to 1. It's going off 12 to 1. I'm taking that. So I, I, that's a very big disadvantage not seeing the board, obviously. And look, value investment plays are price-dependent. So if I don't get my price... There isn't any bet. It's not like this horse is going to win because I say so and my numbers are said I'm so smart. No, no. There's risk in horse racing. Horses fall down. I had an albatross, okay, a seagull, at Aqueduct fly into my horse at a five-length lead in the stretch. And the horse got spooked and, and they lost. There's a lot of ways, ways to, <laughs> to lose a horse race. I mean, every horse player has a story like that, right? But listen. You must get enough price to offset the risk that you're taking. But value is not just price. It's got to be solid horse, right? It's got to make some kind of sense. Otherwise, you just, you know, bet numbers and, uh, you know, long prices. I treat it like roulette. I, all the same to me. And there will be plenty of, of price on Breeders' Cup. And, and the attitude is to just, well, if I play three more Superfectas, you know, come on. Very few, very few will be solid value bets. As you see, I'm only going to point to a couple, the two or three maybe. The value capper line is based largely on pace. Now, it's a good line. Uh, we have verified it over hundreds of thousands of races in our database, and that's not an exaggeration. The top horse on our odds line wins more than the second, wins more than the third, wins more than the fourth, all the way down, absolutely in perfect uh, succession. Maybe there's a difference between the 13th and 14th they flipped i don't know how that happened but okay but but seriously and the top uh two horses uh win almost 50 percent of the time the winner is in the top five over 85 percent of the time and so forth so it's a decent line but it's based largely on pace that means it uses the incremental velocity that is the fractional times so it uses the fractional times. It couples that with the pace and position. There's a lot of formulas to do that. You can do that by hand. I describe that in Handicapping Magic and all. And there's a lot of ways to do it. I'm sure those of you who are not familiar with my work know plenty of ways to do that. But it couples that and it makes the line out of that. Now, not so great once you get over 9.5 furlongs, mile and three sixteenths. And horses with no internal fractions guess what? I can't get an incremental velocity out of that. So I have no ratings. And this year, the 2019 Breeders' Cup, there are races with many foreign horses, no internals, no incremental velocity, no ratings, and a very iffy race. So the combination of long races, many foreign horses mean, I'm just going to tell you, there'll be several passes. Now, if you want to go find an expert who knows about breeding and foreign horses and foreign training is who's good to bring the horses in and uh, who's good at the quarantine horse, whatever, whatever. Fine. I don't know about that. And, and you know, I know what I don't know, and I'm not going to share with you um, things that I don't know. I don't know it. Um, here's a point I always make on big days. Often the value is on the undercards. You can find value in the Santa Anita undercards and in the smaller tracks that are running the, you know, the, Parkses and and so forth. Um, there's a lot of amateur money, casual money in the pools on Breeders' Cup Day. Hey, let's go to the races. It's Breeders' Cup as if, I don't know, yeah, it's a great day for a horse racing fan. I love it. I love the pageantry and, you know, it's a big event and million dollar purses and yeah, great. But for a betting day, eh, sometimes you can find some, you know, some good shots and sometimes not. But the undercards, People often overlook it. Now, I've only got Santa Anita this year. 
um, this far in advance. So uh, there are one or two interesting undercard races that I will share with you. And look, there's a difference between solid value bets and recreational betting. Now, <clears throat> too many recreational bets, no good. The old racing saw is true, that it's not the bad beats that hurt the player as much as the bad bets. So you want to limit the bad bets, the bets that you don't feel really good about, that are making you, that are your quote-unquote prime bets. However, on big days like Breeders' Cup and, and Triple Crown, uh, re recreational bets are understandable. I give into it myself a little bit as a racing fan. It's like, boy, I, I don't know. I want to be involved in this race somehow. Oh, look, I'll show you a couple of secondary bets that I'm probably going to make. They're not the most solid. They're a chance to bet a little to make a lot, uh, but they're very different than prime bets. So with all of that being said, I'd like to invite you to come and look over my shoulder as I actually use the software to value cap, if you will, the races for the 2019 Breeders' Cup. And this is going to be done warts and all. This is what my software looks like. It's the software I use every day. It's the same software that I share with the Wizards and the Wizards Forum and the, and the um, uh, people who have Value Capper. Um, and it's an absolute standard default mode. Um, that's why it's default mode is because those are the settings that I use. So I'll share the, all that with you. Some of the races I'm going to go through very quickly, the ones with the unknowns. We'll look at all the races and then I will show you my recap. So come on, look over my shoulder as I take you through the races with Value Capper. Okay, so here we are at the Value Capper main screen, and I'm going to take you through the uh, Breeders' Cup races, and I'm going to go rather quickly because there are several uh, pass races. And what do I mean by a pass race? Well, take this Santa Anita 5th race, November 1st. It's the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint, and you see this indicator that there are seven unknowns, seven no ratings, and you can see why. These horses down here, this Aiden O'Brien um, Colt King Neptune, uh, it's got all foreign races, no internals. Um, uh, Joseph O'Brien uh, Colt Air Force Jet, all internals. I'm not saying these horses have no chances. It's just that they have no internal fractions from which I can make my rating. So when you see those unknowns, know that's why I am passing these races. Now we come to the sixth race at Santa Nina, November 1st, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf. Uh, this is a rather easy call for me. Uh, I have two horses gapped from the rest of the field, the two Structor and the one Our Country. If you notice, um, Structor is two for two. Uh, one, uh, his maiden, and then came into the grade three Pilgrim. Uh, on the turf at a mile and 16th and one. It was a rather tough race. And you see the indicator V hard, very hard race. Now, a colt that came out of that same race, our country, finished third. I think this, uh, this colt will be overlooked by the public because, well, it's only got one win out of four starts and it just lost to um to structor the morning line maker made it 15 to 1 my contention line which is the the line i think the public will go for kind of agrees at 14 to 1 so i would um i would look for this cult as a reasonable bet and i would look for the value capper price that's kind of my target odds based on a lot of different factors, but at 11 to 1, uh, again, I'm betting in advance without scratches and so, but this would be a, a a bet for me, the number one our country in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf. The seventh race at Santa Anita, the Bre Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. Now, here's one of those races that I see a lot. Here are the top four horses Donna Veloce, Wicked Whisper, British Idiom, and Bast. And look at their morning lines. 3 to 1, 7 to 2, 7 to 2, 7 to 2. Then there's a gap down to the next horse. 
um, Philly, actually. And, you know, do you really want to make uh, distinctions? Donna Veloci only wanted uh, her maiden. Um, Wicked Whispers, the winner of the Frisette. Um, the, the British Idiom won the um, grade one at, at Keeneland. And Bast was, uh, won a, a grade one at Santa Anita. I, I don't want to pick among uh, those short horses. They're going to be short. So for that reason, that's a pass for me. The, and then we come to the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. I'm not going to go through this. There are seven unknowns, as you'll notice in the race. And I won't go through all of them, but uh, Etoile, uh, uh, Aiden O'Brien Philly, no internal f- uh, fractions. Another Aiden O'Brien Philly Tango, no internal fractions. I'm not saying these... Uh, these fillies have no chance in the race. It's just that um, I have no internal fractions from which to make ratings. The ninth race on November 1st is the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. And it's a bit of an interesting race. The colt that I have on top with a gap is eight rings. And normally, you know, I'm, I'm skittish about betting against these. Remember, well, not remember, if you don't know value capper, it gives the other horses a a lot of benefit of the doubt. So if you have a horse on top with a, uh, with a gap and it's, you know, the morning line, uh, you know, second favorite, a two to one, Dennis's moment is who the morning line uh, maker made um, eight to five. It, you know, this is an obvious cult. Uh, he won his uh, maiden at first asking, uh, dumped the jockey in the Del Mar Futurity, uh, won the American Pharaoh going away at uh, Santa Anita uh, at this exact distance, a mile and a sixteenth. I am, I, I, I'm a little bit hesitant to bet against this colt. If you look at acupressure, which is the way I you know, all things being equal, I project the race to shape up. Eight rings should have it all his own way with the lead. Um, there's a bit of a gap down to the other four uh, Colts shoplifted Dennis's moment. Let's take a look at Dennis's moment. Um, how much you can say wrong about that? Uh, this Colt, I mean, uh, again, Lost the jockey at its maiden uh, debut. Came back and won by 19 lengths at Ellis Park. Uh, won the Grade Three Iroquois at Churchill. Um, you know this is a racehorse. Dale Romans trained. Um, <sighs> tough to bet against those uh, those Colts. If I had to, I'm looking a little bit at Shoplifted. Uh, its numbers are not outstanding but his maiden win was competitive uh got a slop race uh and at saratoga at seven furlongs in the hopeful and still managed to finish second at a a number that i give which is close to eight rings last race and then don't know what happened in the american pharaoh uh it went wide. It had kind of an unusual trip. There's a switch from Rosario back to Santana, who rode him in his first uh, win, the maiden special. Um, this would be a uh, recreational bet, and only if I'm looking at something like 15 uh, to 1 and up. There are a couple of interesting undercard um, opportunities. The second race, uh, Heather's uh, Gray is at top of the line, the nine. Um, you know, not much wrong with it, but, but I have two horses just about tied uh, with this one. And that is the three Kooky Gal. Now, it's on a layoff since February. However, it's been working out. And notice that. Uh, she won her maiden win at first asking. That's a long layoff. Now, um, the price will be there on this horse because she's a state bred. Um, Notice second race back, she almost won an open allowance, which is pretty was a pretty decent race. That's a possibility, as is Rockin' Ready, um, 
This is a filly who has been successful at a mile, third start after layoff. She had uh, a sprint at Del Mar on the turf, um, ran a decent race, finishing two and three quarters lengths back. Then a dirt sprint doesn't seem to be this filly's forte. Um, I don't like the four seconds out of 10 lifetime starts. However, if they ignore these uh, fillies, the three and the five, at 12, 15 to one, somewhere in that range, I would take a shot at either or both of them. Okay, so that's my lookout at, I'm not going to go through the other other undercards. There's not much in the in, in the rest of the undercard races. And we've got a bunch of Breeders' Cup races to look at on November 2nd. And we start with the fourth race on November 2nd, the Santa Anita Breeders' Cup Philly Amer Sprints. Now, you notice I've passed a number of races uh, because of the unknowns. Well, here we've got knowns. We've got Kofefe. Um, a winner of five out of her seven races, seven furlongs, seems to be a good distance for this filly, is two for two at seven furlongs. About the only negative I would say is that uh, this race may have a lot of pressure in it. If you notice that um, Kofefi will have the lead, but I think uh, she will be pressed by Selcourt, the seven, uh, perhaps the two for a little while. Uh, Danuska's my girl. Um, Lady Ninja should be in the mix. There might be pressure developed. And so I would look for um, the other, well, the other filly, the, the mayor actually come dancing. Well, she's a bit of an early, um, an early runner herself. However, given the numbers... And they both they both have decent late fractions in this field. They are the two morning line favorites. And when I have two obvious horses on top, the only thing might be a pace scenario that could defeat it. I don't really see value in this race. So for me, it's a pass. We go to the Santa Anita fifth on November second, the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint. This is a race with a bunch of texture. The my line starts at eight to one. That means I am saying that if they ran the race nine times, the the winner of this would uh, you know if at eight to one if they ran the race nine times, I've got it would win once. <laughs> okay, that's eight losses to one win. Okay, that's that's what eight to one means. So. That's already getting pretty speculative. So couple the fact that the uh, top um, the top contender in this race is the 12 Belvoir Bay. I looked at this mare. Uh, she's done very well at five furlongs, two wins and two seconds out of four races. One thing that's interesting is that uh, she seems to run awfully well after a layoff. You notice those lines, and we see the layoff from June 18 to October 12th, ran a very close second, then then was laid off from October 12th to October to January 12th and won, and then was laid off from March to May, again, a very close second. And so... This mare can run after a layoff. Uh, it's a it's a very iffy race to bet. Um, Sheki Shabazz, the fours, got my interest a little bit. It was a phenomenal number that it ran at Belmont last out. Don't know if that was aberrant or not. Um, has never run the five furlong distance on the turf. Both of these should be overlooked. I would um, probably look for something in the 20 to 1 range to make a recreational or a secondary bet. Certainly not a prime bet on this. Certainly not on, you know, a filly or mare. Uh, actually, Sheki Shabazz is a gelding, excuse me, that, you know, are 8 and 9 to 1 on my line. So a normal day, I'm passing. Eh, 
When I see two 12 to 1 morning line shots at the top of my line, it piques my interest a little bit. I'll probably take a recreational bet. In the Breeders' Cup, I'm not going to say the full name of this. I'm trying to keep this family friendly. The Breeders' Cup Turf Mile. We have another one of these races where um, the two obvious uh, colts in the race, Omaha Beach, right on top, no surprise, and right beneath it is improbable. I would um, normally look at Diamond Oops, and uh, he had a very tough race last out. Don't know if he's up to competing uh, with Omaha Beach and improbable even though uh, his numbers are good. Um, it's never gone a mile on the dirt, stretching out. Uh, I would need enormous odds, and I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, that would be a pure speculation. This is a, is a pass race for me. A mile and a quarter race on the turf in the Santa Anita Race 7, the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare turf. There are six unknowns in the race. Again, I won't go through it all. These are... Uh, predominantly foreign uh, horses from Great Britain and Ireland uh, that have no um, no internal fractions, so I can't get ratings on them. Uh, internal internal fractions. Aiden O'Brien shows up again with a nice filly, for example, in the Santa Anita Eighth, the Breeders' Cup Sprint. This is usually one of my favorite races in Breeders' Cup. Why? Because it comes up highly pressured. I like highly pressured races and sprints because the public is usually reticent about betting a closer in a sprint. They want early speed, right? So uh, I look here. I don't see much. The top four horses are, you know, the morning line favorites. Obviously, the morning line maker is confused in the race. We've got a little trick in value capper you see this red value capper has looked through the recent races at this distance six furlongs at santa anita and it analyzes what the track profile is and you don't need a computer for this uh, beaten lengths is zero zero and 0.5 at the first call zero zero and 0.1 at the second call and it's got an early energy expenditure so here we have the track favoring early runners at six furlongs and yet we see a lot of pressure in the race so don't like those um, those races are confusing one thing that uh, we can do is set the bias instead of late to neutral and we see the six chance uh, chance a lot the four Mitoli and the nine imperial hint um, now these are all early runners uh, don't like that in a race that may be highly pressured even though the track favors it and so what they're going to be bet and if we go early those same three uh, horses come up the four the six and the nine so it's a confusing race i'm uh i've clicked around i still find the same three morning line favorites on top that is a pass sadly for me in the breeders cup mile uh the ninth race uh, i've got six unknowns again i'm just not going to spend a lot of time on this i'm passing the Santa Anita 10th. This is the Breeders' Cup Distaff. Not much of a call that I have to make in this race. The acupressure projection is unpressured. It's because Serengeti Empress looks like um, the leader. She may have the lead at both calls. I believe that she may be overlooked by the public because of that very poor finish in the cotillion at Parks in September, finishing 6th by 14th. But notice that was after a layoff, showed some early speed, and then just kind of relaxed after that. But she was second in the test, grade one, second in the acorn, winner of the Kentucky 
Oaks. Um, she's a racehorse. She's on top. Her morning line is 12 to 1. My contention line is 13 to 1. Without knowing anything else, I would bet this in advance. I, I would absolutely um, take this. Um, probably going to need something like 8 to 1. Um, another interesting uh, interesting filly is Mo Seacow. Now, does she belong with this company on classic uh, class handicapping? No. Oh, she's won, you know, there's a allowance non-winners two with some qualifying stuff. Uh, she did finish uh, a neck back fourth in the um, Del Mar Solano Beach, a little handy, 150,000 handicap for state bred um, fillies. I, I think the extent to which I would use that is in um, exotics. Same thing with Paradise Woods. Um, nothing much wrong uh, about this mare, but if they're going to let Serengeti Empress go off, you know, eight, ten to one, uh, as my contention line and the morning line would indicate, I think she has a real um, chance to uh, wire this field. Uh, by the way, that's how she won the Kentucky Oaks on May 3rd. Um, a Churchill Downs just wire to wire at 13 to one. So she's one for one at nine furlongs at uh, mile and an eighth. So that for me is a solid bet. Um, I'm going to make short work of the next two. <laughs> this is a mile and a half on the turf. Uh, strike one. Uh, there are eight unknowns uh, because, well, you know, these uh, European horses love those long distance. And again, here's Aiden O'Brien with a nice Colt, Mount Everest, and, you know, no internal fractions. Alnac, the uh, the French um, French Colt. Now, I, I just, sorry, I can't play this. Don't don't have enough information that I like to use. And finally, the one everyone waits for. Uh, now, sit down. I hope you're sitting down. I've got McKinsey right on top. A controversial call right from the beginning. Um, this is a Colt in 13 lifetime starts. Has won seven. Has finished second five times. Um, I guess the thing that everyone's going to notice is that in last year's Breeders' Cup Classic, uh, he was bet down a four to one and just really never sh showed up in the race. I ran a couple of calls and then finished 12th. So I think people will have a uh, different, uh, you know, a memory of that. Um, is it a solid racehorse? Yeah. Does Bob Baffert have his horses generally conditioned well? Yeah. Has it been working bullets? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know about the switch from Mike Smith to, uh, to Rosario. I, I don't know what to make of it. This is the kind of horse I don't really want to bet, don't really want to bet against. There are a couple of champions um, here. The uh, Jockey Club uh, Gold Cup winner, Vino Rosso, uh, who won the Gold Cup also at Santa Anita, who won the Stymie. I mean... This is another champion horse that may be uh, colt and may be hard to beat. And, you know, everyone's kind of wise guy horse, code of honor. Nothing to say wrong about that. I mean, won the Travers f for criminy's sake. I mean, this is a real racehorse. I don't really want to bet McKinsey, and I certainly won't get a price. I'm not anxious to bet against it. We've got a couple of champions down below. Uh, don't have great numbers because I don't have numbers on some of the races because they were at a you know, mile and a quarter. Um, a horse of some interest is Owendale. I'm, I, I liked Owendale a little bit in the Preakness this year, and he finished third at, you know, eight to one. Um, it, it won the Ohio Derby. It just won the um, Oklahoma Derby at Remington Park. Um, does it belong with these? Probably not. Um, other than the uh, the third, well, you know, finished fifth in the Travers, and you know, 
I, I'm, I'm looking only, I'm tempted only a little bit because the morning line maker made this 15 to 1. This would definitely not be a prime bet because I'm not anxious to bet against um, McKinsey. And I certainly don't want to bet him um, with the presence of Vino Rosso, Code of Honor, even Yoshida uh, in the race. Elate, I've got a, I've got a bunch of Colts that um and and horses that might um that might do uh do well elate being a, a mayor I'm, I'm not thrilled about that um i don't know this doesn't feel like a really great bet to me only as a recreational 2025 to one uh, because i liked him in the uh, preakness and because he has decent numbers and because he just ran that nice race at remington uh, and his numbers are relatively relatively competitive, although kind of far back. So we, you know, that that Remington number is relatively low in this field. So basically, it's a pass race. If they give me a high enough price on Owendale, twenty twenty five to one or something, I would have a secondary bet. And that's how I go through the Breeders' Cup races. Oh wait, there is an undercard. Um, race of which I am um, I'm fond of. Here's one that's um, okay. This is the third race where su- uh, succeed and surpass gets my top number. I may look at that uh, at um, oh ten twelve to one. Uh, nothing really wrong with this colt um, gray magician. And Mo Forza, that would probably be a little recreational um, exacta box. Um, 20 to 1 on Mo Forza, I may be interested in taking a little win bet. Um, you know, these are obviously not champions after the, after the horses that we just looked at. But there is one, the second race at Santa Anita, that I am fond of. And that is, um, I have uh, the, the, one, the one horse, Horse Greedy. And I say that because this is a highly pressured race at seven furlongs. Now, seven furlongs is a different race at Santa Anita than six furlongs. Remember, early on, we saw the track profile at um, six furlongs, which ran pretty early, whereas at seven furlongs, and we have to go back a little bit to find races that have been run at seven furlongs at Santa Anita. And when we do the... Uh, energy is still a little early. However, horses positionally can come back from three, four, five lengths. And so it's not quite as um, demanding that a horse be early. When we look at the acupressure, we see Comical Ghost and Flagstaff, the six to five favorite, and, you know, a number of horses. And Horse Greedy is going to be in that mix. However, it's the horse that has a closing running style. Add that to when we look at Flagstaff, we see that it ran third in the Santa Anita uh, grade one that it ran in last time at six furlongs. And guess who ran with it? Horse Greedy. Well, ran with it is a little generous because it finished five by 13 lengths. But again, that was after a layoff, showed a little speed. But then the other races that it ran, um, you know, he ran pretty well. I noticed that he's got a win at seven furlongs, right, all the way at the bottom of its past performances, where it came from off the pace. I like that in a highly pressured race. Uh, It's got a number of short closes. I like that in a a highly pressured race. From the morning lines point of view, it's the the longest uh, price on the board. My contention line says it's going to be big. I think the crowd will dismiss it because it just lost by 13 lengths to Flagstaff. Um, All of that put together, and this is a nice, decent, you know, run-of-the-mill race. If the pressure develops and this horse could come off the pace and get a nice, uh, you know, a nice close, it'll have to withstand probably a close from Roadster, who's got some very strong late fractions. 
Uh, this is uh, this is a colt that ran in the Kentucky Derby. Santa, this, he won the Santa Anita Derby. You know he's a you know he's a champion horse. Another reason why Horse Greedy will be um, probably a big price, and I'll need it to to bet against you know the kind of horse like Roadster. But I think that um, Flagstaff might be beatable. I would take a um, an exacta, you know. Probably with everyone, but emphasizing Flagstaff a little bit because they ran together last time. So that's the way I go through these races with um, with Value Capper. And the thing that makes it streamlined, well, number one is having all the numbers crunching done, having all the track profiles done, having it, having all the pace projection done, having it all analyzed in a way that you know makes sense to me and is laid out in an easy way, but And here's the big thing. We are handicapping the value and thus the word value capping. I'm not just looking for the winner. Oh, this horse can't lose because he's on top and he's the class of the field. No, 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 no. Hey, here's a a horse that's in shouting distance and you may get more of a price than his numbers would indicate. So I really thought... um, I really thought you'd enjoy seeing that process uh, in the Breeders' Cup and the undercard races for the 2019 Breeders' Cup. Now, I'd like to give you a quick recap uh, of the races, just a summary form. Um, So just kind of to summarize it all and summarize my thinking uh, on these races and, uh, and the bets I would make and the bets I will not. Well, that's it for the analysis of the races for the 2019 Breeders' Cup. I wanted to give you a quick recap. And for those of you not interested in theory and all of that, welcome. (laughs) Welcome to the video because I know you fast forwarded to here. So here's the recap. These are the races from November 1st. Santa Anita 5, Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint, 7 Unknowns. I'm passing. The sixth race on November 1st, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies Turf. This is a solid bet for me. I am going to take the one, our country. I need to get 11 to one or more. Um, I will take exactas with the two. It's probably going to be bet, but I think that's a good combination. One, two, box and straight. On the seventh race, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. The obvious horses are on top. The one, the seven, the four, the six. Uh, three of them would have been in graded's, one uh, not. Uh, it's still, they're all going to be bet. It's a pass for me. Um, the eighth race on, on Friday, November 1st, uh, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf, seven unknowns. I'm passing. And finally, the ninth race, uh, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Uh, the obvious horse, Eight Rings, is on top. Uh, is he the most fantastic favorite? Um, no. Uh, is he a, is she strong? Yeah. Um, I think if I if I got 15 to 20 to 1 on the three shoplifted, I would take a secondary bet. And now, <laughs> pause, we go to November 2nd, the Saturday races. So the fourth race, the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint. Look, I, I put the same horses that the public will be betting on top of my line, Kofefi and Come Dancing. They're going to be very short. I don't want to bet them, don't want to bet against them. In the fifth race, the Breeders' Cup turf sprint um i say pass i've got a secondary bet here i'm going to look at the prices on the 12 and the four and if i get box cars on either or both i will bet either or both and i'm talking the 15 to 20 to 1 range the 12 horse and the four horse so um again chance to bet a little make a lot it's this will be in the level of a recreational bet for me but you know, it's a possibility, and they run one, two. Boy, that could be real boxcars. In the Santa Anita race six, the Breeders' Cup Turf Mile, again, pass for me. The obvious horses are on top. Omaha Beach and Improbable. And you know, God, I, I watch, I, I haven't watched any videos, by the way, on, on the 2019 um, Breeders' Cup, mainly because I, I, I don't have much hair left. And I want to pull out what's left of me. People are like, oh, it's going to be Omaha Beach. It's going to be improbable. They're going to be 8 to 5 and 2 to 1. Who cares? Yeah, they look like strong horses. Okay, so it's pass. I don't want to bet them. I don't want to bet against them. If an outsider beats me, okay. 
my look out at the race is these are the strong horses in the race. They're also the horses that the public should really like. So pass. The seventh race, the Breeders' Cup, Philly and Mare Turf, seven unknowns. No thank you. Mm, there you go. In the Breeders' Cup Sprint, the eighth race on Saturday, November 2nd. Usually one of my favorite races, highly pressured. Uh, Santa Anita is not very kind to closers at sprints these days. I fooled around with this race and looked at different pace scenarios. I still get obvious horses, the six, four, and nine on top. I think those horses will be bet. Uh, gosh, uh, one of them might be a price. Uh, they may they may, may let one of the other contenders off at a big box cars, but really this is a pass race for me. The Breeders' Cup Mile, six unknowns. I'm passing. Gee, Michael, aren't you ever going to bet a horse? Well, you know, look, I can't make <laughs> bets happen. But in the 10th race, Santa Anita race 10, the Breeders' Cup distaff, I'm going to take a win bet on the nine, top of my line, Serengeti Express. I'll take her at eight to one or higher. I'm going to use the 10, uh, which is a real bomb long shot. I know it doesn't belong in the race and the class. Oh, it's got some decent back numbers, 30 to one morning line. I'm going to use them in exotics. And I'll use the one in exotics. But um, this to me seems like a fairly solid bet. Uh, she's a pretty solid little runner. So I'm going to take uh, Serengeti Empress at 8 to 1 and higher. In the 11th race, the Breeders' Cup turf, there are eight unknowns. It's a mile and a half. No thank you. And finally, in the Breeders' Cup Classic, I'm going to pass. There's an obvious horse, McKinsey, on top of my line. Don't want to bet the horse don't want to bet against it uh gosh if i don't know if they'll go crazy on because they're you know they're really good good horses in this race so uh i remember what mckinsey did last year in the breeders cup classic not so well i think uh, he finished 12th uh at four to one and uh you know, not very impressive uh but I, I don't find very much uh, in the race behind it uh, that might be a price that looks solid, with, with the exception of uh, the three Owendale. And I know this colt is three years old, running against older. I, I, I like this horse a little bit, I think, in exotics in the Preakness this year, I believe, uh, where it was in the, uh, he was in the money. Um, so... As a secondary bet, not as a prime bet, I would look to Owendale if I got, you know, 20 to 1 or more. But I don't want to mess around with M McKinsey. I mean, I know people will be of the opinion, well, you know, he's just so unpredictable and look what happened last year. And then others will say, yeah, well, look at his numbers lately. And both of those things are true. So certainly not going to take him at whatever he goes off, 3 to 1, 7 to 2. No, it's not worth it, but... Honestly, don't want to bet heavily against it, especially with the likes of the other, you know, really good, solid champion horses in this race. Well, that's my recap for the Breeders' Cup 2019 to be held at Santa Anita, November 1st and 2nd, 2019. I thank you so much for spending this time with me, for being open to hearing a different approach to the races rather than, hey, uh, Ralphie, who do you like? You, you, you know what I mean. <laughs> Um, because it's not about any race, any, any day of racing, but it's about making good value bets where you're getting more of a price than you quote unquote should based on your work. Okay. And that I believe in the modern game with the proliferation of really good numbers, well, I've got really good numbers. I worked on them for 20 years, 25 years. I refined them. I think they're really, really good. But other numbers have, you know, there are numbers out there that are good enough, you know, that'll get you in the same ballpark sometimes. Not all the time. I mean, sometimes we make great calls because I do things, you know, differently. But by and large, that's why I'm finding more and more uh, my odds line in, in not every race, but a few races, they just agree with the public. But I've learned with uh, playing this game a long time, rather than try to split hairs, 
I turn the page is a reference to the old printed past performances, right? You just go on to the next race. There are hundreds of races, um, well, 100 and change every day just about to, uh, to look at. So, you know, I spend time on those. So, anyway, thanks. I really appreciate it. Please take away from this video the value of looking for, get the handicapping out of the way. Get the putting your horses into an order or a line as how you like them. Those of you who use software, that'll usually be done for you. Those of you who use uh, our software, the Value Capper or Black Magic or whatever, the, the line is done for you, okay? But just get the value capping out of your way and then focus on value. Horses you like, the public shouldn't wait for your price. Hopefully you got a, a vulnerable favorite. And then get a felt sense and let the bet make you. So until next time, thank you again. Remember, keep your powder dry. Stay cool, calm, and relaxed so you can get that sense of what when the bet is making you. And good luck at Breeders' Cup. And always, see you soon.